Today, we really heard from, from innovators and pioneers across a wide variety of frontier technologies, uh, participating from all around the globe. Um, I'm, I'm really privileged to have such a, a wide breadth of esteemed peers um, and speakers. We discussed space, climate change, family office portfolio allocation, alternative asset investment, um, COVID, US elections, trade financing, um, and even the shifting regulatory and legal environment. For, for our last discussion today, uh, we're going to be talking, uh, I'm going to be having a fireside chat with, with Mr. Michael Turpin, who will be joining us in just a second. Um, and, and the subject of our conversation is tracking the next bull market. Um, so, so to give a brief background on Michael, uh, Michael has a very long and storied career. Uh, I believe he's joining us from, from San Juan right now. I like the background, Michael. And, and I drew a fire for us. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm actually not in San Juan. I'm, I'm actually in Las Vegas this week. Um, this is my pool in the backyard here in Las Vegas. But I will be in San Juan starting this weekend for uh, pretty much the rest of the winter and spring. Not a bad place to be. Uh, I've got my fire to warm me up. So. <laughs> <A little. laughs> um, so, so, Michael, just to dive right in, um, I'll give a brief background about yourself. Um, so, so Michael is the founder and chief uh, executive officer of Transform Group. Um, they have several uh, divisions. Um, Transform PR is a global public relation firm that served uh, more than 200 clients worldwide. Um, and, and even more notably, uh, they've helped over 100 ICOs come to market. I believe that is the, the most out of any organization in the world. Um, Michael is also the founder of Coin Agenda, uh, which is a global event series for crypto entrepreneurs and investors. Um, and, and just to touch on it, they, they are having an event uh, October 28th, Michael? October 28th and 29th. Fantastic. So, so I encourage you guys to, to check that out, the Coin Agenda Global Event. Um, he also, uh, the, the company was launched in 2014. Um, he also has Transform Strategies, which is the company's advisory division. Um, and Transform Group also owns a blockchain incubator and accelerator based in Bermuda uh, called Transform Studios. Um, Mike is also noted for, for being the founder of BitAngels, which is the world's first angel network for digital currency startups. Uh, I personally have partic participated as, as an investor and a, a participant in some of their events that they hold globally. Um, and, and I know they've occurred in, in probably over 20 countries at this point. Um, and, and previous to his foray into blockchain, um, Michael was also the founder of MarketWire and, and had a big focus on PR. MarketWire is one of the world's largest newswire companies, which sold to NASDAQ for about $200 million uh, prior to being reacquired. Um, and, and also Direct IPO, which is one of the world's earliest uh, equity crowdfunding platforms. Um, so, Michael, I, I think it's interesting, um, you know, seeing especially that involvement in, in Direct IPO. You've been thinking about uh, similar problems for a long time prior to the advent of ICOs um, and your storied involvement. Um, can you give kind of a quick summary of why you initially got involved in, in the digital asset space and, and with ICO issuance in the first place? Um, and, and maybe even touch on how your, your involvement and your conviction in the, uh, the process and the landscape has changed over time. Uh Thanks, Zach. Um, I guess uh, in, in my career, uh, I've always been looking for the next big thing and to sort of get ahead of it. Um, I started uh, my first set of companies in the 1990s. And uh, back then, you know, there was this big buzz around this thing called the web. And, uh, you know, been on the internet uh, when it was, uh, you know, something you had to pretty much go to university and, uh, and use a, a, a you know, Unix or Linux terminal, uh, Linux was in its infancy then too, uh, Unix terminal to be able to get on board. You can use these tools called uh, Finger and Archie and Veronica. And uh, there was no web. The web started in 91. And I started getting involved in uh, 92. And then early 93, I came up with the idea for the first internet-based press release distribution company since I was already running a uh, PR firm that was, you know, big in video games and uh, and uh, multimedia, which was uh, sort of the <clears throat> next big thing at the time in the early '90s. And um, you know, once I saw, um, you know, once I downloaded the one of the earliest uh, web browsers, uh, I guess it was the first one, that Mosaic, 
um, and uh, saw that I could go and type lube.fr and I would be transported in one click to uh, paintings in real time. I realized that this was a, a unbelievable game changer and it would be leading uh, you know, next wave of innovation. And so I pretty much tried to go and meet all the early internet companies that I could in 1994 um, and, and launched uh, Internet Wire, which became Market Wire and is now rolled up after the uh, uh, NASDAQ acquisition uh, with another newswire. And it's now called Globe Newswire, which is the third largest newswire in the world. And it's currently owned by uh, Apollo. Um, and uh, to wit, I, uh, I actually, at Transform, uh, we spun off a company called Content Syndicate, which has a deal with, um, uh, with Globe uh, to create a few new news wires, of, including Blockchain Wire, which is a, uh, the only kind of dedicated blockchain um, press release distribution company. And we have some innovation that we're gonna be rolling out in that uh, involving digital assets. So. Um, but I would say that uh, the 1990s was all about just really deep dive into the internet. I remember in 1995 uh, trying to figure out who all the other internet entrepreneurs were. And I mean, I think I came up with like 10 of them. I mean, there really just weren't that many people who had active businesses in late 94, early 95. Uh, and, um, you know, most of them did pretty well. Uh, they had to pivot a few times. But, um, you know, and so that kept me busy through the end of that decade, uh, sold my first PR firm uh, to uh, uh, roll up, uh, it became known as Financial Dynamics, it was a uh, investor, investor relations roll up and we were the only PR firm because we were just, you know, <laughs> tossing out all these, uh, you know, they didn't call them unicorns back then, but they were dot coms that went public about every week or two and, um, you know, got off that uh, merry-go-round at the right time before the crash. And uh, then uh, took um, uh, raised funds from Sequoia Capital to uh, grow uh, Internet Wire, um, and we did a strategic deal with Nasdaq. Changed the name of the company to Market Wire um, because we just saw a much bigger opportunity to be dealing with public companies, uh, their earnings, et cetera, and being faster, better, cheaper, and not relying on satellite distribution as our competitors, Peer News Wire, Business Wire did, and sold that in 2006. Um, moved into social media, started a company called Social Radius. We were one of the early social media marketing firms and uh, worked with bigger companies like Philips and Marriott and also uh, sort of helped pioneer uh, viral video marketing. We did uh, the Yes We Can uh, video for Will I Am that got 50 million views and a few other iconic uh, um, campaigns. And then early 2013, I was kind of looking for the next big thing because uh, uh, social media had started to consolidate a bit. And uh, about every 10 years, it seemed like some new game-changing technology came around. And so in the 80s, it was the PC. And uh, I, rather, the 70s was the PC. I was way too young to be involved in business then. Um, in the 80s, it was the network um, in, in online services. In the 90s, it was certainly the internet, which is a huge wave. Uh, in the 00s, it was um, the noughts, uh, was uh, social media. And then... Um, you know, in 2013 is when I discovered uh, Bitcoin and went right down the rabbit hole and saw that digital assets were going to be um, as as big or larger than uh, the layer of social media. And um, I pretty much pivoted everything toward, uh, uh, you know, Transform Group, uh, which was a diversified services company, is a diversified services company um, in, the, um, in the blockchain and cryptocurrency sector. Um, you know, with the PR firm, since I've had PR firms uh, over the years um, as sort of the first PR firm with about a two-year uh, jump on uh, the next firm to even get into space, um, we ended up, you know, rolling out some of the early campaigns. The first ICO was uh, MasterCoin. Um, you know, you're, you're in Toronto. Uh, uh, we, we, uh, we launched, we helped launch uh, Ethereum with Vitalik when uh, he and Anthony DiOrio were, you know, kind of um, in, in Toronto before they, you know, relocated the foundation to Switzerland. And um, I'd worked with uh, Anthony. Anthony, by the way, is going to be one of our uh, keynotes at the Coin Agenda next week, a fireside chat, uh, along with Eric Voorhees and a few other big names. So coinagenda.com, you can get information. Um, and, um, you know, so I saw that digital assets were going to, you know, be 
a thing that I wanted to really double down on. And, uh, you know, 120 token sales later and about 300 companies we've worked with in the blockchain sector um, uh, between PR advisory, um, you know, investor events with the uh, big angels and, um, you know, still uh, enjoying the, uh, the DeFi and NFT explosion we've been having. And, you know, I, I think along the way, I've, I've sort of um, become an accidental thought leader um, by being one of the er, er, first, you know, investors in the space um, of note. So I was on all the panels on, um, you know, how to invest in cryptocurrency and do you want to buy equity in the companies or do you want to buy in the tokens and, you know, what, what are the token economics? And uh, so that's been a very big um, part of, uh, of sort of my education is really studying how crypto markets uh, act differently than equities markets um, in a number of ways that I can get into later. But uh, I think the first big thing is that they're four-year cycles instead of 10-year cycles, and they're around the having. So we're headed into what historically should be the next bull market. So it was about a year and a half after the, um, uh, after the having. So 2012, the having was at $12. And uh, um, the fourth quarter of the following year, it was 1200 100x. Um, much smaller numbers and you pretty much had to get it on Mount Gox and not too many other places. Then it crashed back down to 150 uh, about a year and a half uh, after. And uh, then you had a slow kind of period of consolidation, which has happened every cycle. And um, we, uh, you know, then moved from the having at 630 up 30x to 19,000 and change uh, fourth quarter of 2017. Wash and repeat, you know, we ended up having a crash then of similar uh, amounts, about 85% down to the low around, you know, the low 3000s at the start of uh, um, 2019. And crypto's dead, Bitcoin's dead, all the headlines coming back again. But that's really when I and other people were, were buying Bitcoin, we're acquiring more Bitcoin because that's the time of the cycle to get it. And, um, you know, anybody who bought it around, you know, under 4,000 is, uh, up 3x in a year and a half. And, you know, we're now getting to the historic point where, um, you know, we hit the halving at 8,500. Um, it won't be up 100x <laughs> by the end of next year. It probably won't even be up 30x. But I think in the 5 to 10x uh, range over 8,500, which, you know, puts you in a nice uh, a profit position from today's 11,900. Yeah, so you touched on uh, quite a few interesting things there. Uh, I'll go one by one. Um, I think it's, you know, what, what some of the attendees might not realize is how immature the market was back in 2013. Uh, you know, I, I obviously had a similar story where when I discovered blockchain, dove down the proverbial rabbit hole, um, ha had a lot of interest. Um, but, you know, the market was more mature in, in 2015, 2016 when, when I found it. Um, from your side, you really had conviction. And, you know, I, I see you as definitely a futurist because of that. And, um, you know, your, your ability to predict the future uh, goes without saying our, our market is, is still in its infancy, uh, but it's grown substantially since your initial involvement. So, you know, just uh, from someone in the industry, I obviously appreciate your involvement. Um, what people from the outside looking in don't realize when we talk about tracking the next bull market is they see the highlights of the, the, top, of the top of the chart and the bottom of the chart. They see the 85% drawdown. Um, but what they don't realize right now is especially uh, volatilities uh, reduced significantly. I think we're the longest time period tracking above 10,000. Um, right. from, from 10 to 20K happened extremely quickly. Um, but right now we're at, I think, 66 weeks um, that, that Bitcoin's been, been above. So we're you know, quite fortunate um, to, to see a more mature and stable market, which allows us to, um, you know, really usher in that new era of capital because it's it's required um you also well, touched it's stable it's stable until it isn't right because what happens in the um in the equities market is um you know pretty predictable i mean you know 10-year cycles at the start of the decade is when you usually have your black swan that pops the overvalued market um you know happened uh, in you know, the end of the 80s with Black Monday, uh, you know, in the early 90s, there were all sorts of pundits saying the stock market will never come back. People are just going to go and, uh, um, you know, one of the top editors at Fortune, uh, uh, Alan Murray, said, yeah, people are, are done with the stock market now. They got burned too badly. The yuppies are going to move to Vermont and live off the land. And the 90s is going to be all about living with less. 
And of course, that was the perfect time to buy into the stock market. It was the biggest bull run in history. And so, you know, being contrarian and, and you know, buying when there's blood in the streets, as uh, Lord Rothschild said, even if it's your own blood, has always been the right move in, in the markets. And, you know, you don't have to be a day trader. You just have to go and buy stocks when there's blood in the streets, which, you know, I, I did the last time I made a sizable move in the stock market was I was all in cash going into the 0809 crash. Um, because I played the other end of the equation, which is sell in May and go away. Because historically over the last you know, 80 years, it's been shown that you do much better being out of the markets during the times of highest volatility during the summers through um, you know, the, uh, the, the, the middle of the fall and just kind of get in before uh, the Santa Claus rally. And uh, the years that you have like a huge crash, you know, 29, 89, uh, 2009 or 2008, 09, um, you know, you were lucky to be out of the market. And I got back in when there was complete blood in the streets. And, uh, you know, by April of 09, it was like you couldn't lose on almost anything. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I bought like the NASDAQ index was which when it was like $20 and it's 200 something now. And, you know, I, I, I you know, it was just an easy way to get in. Uh, and, and, you know, there are corollaries in, in the Bitcoin market, uh, except it's four year cycles. And, um, you know, it's, 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 it, there's less volatility, but you still have um, in, in the traditional markets, you usually have a slow seven to two year, 10 year bull market, um, you know, pumped up by the Fed printing money near the end of it. And they have a pop and a quick drop. It may not be 85%, but in many cases, it's been 60, 70% uh, over that year of drops. Um, Certainly, you had the fifty percent drop to, in March when the when COVID became a re reality. Um, but you know, with um, with Bitcoin, you end up having the opposite. You have very slow bear markets, just you know, painful slow drops over a year and a half or so. And then once during the four year cycle, you have a parabolic run up. And that's happened twice now. They were it went from one hundred dollars to twelve hundred dollars in about five weeks in um, uh, in uh, five or six weeks in twenty thirteen. Uh, it, it went from, you know, $2,000 to $20,000 in under three months um, in uh, 2017. And, um, you know, I predict you're going to see a parabolic run up when there's just a, there, there's a supply squeeze, right? I mean, the having literally cuts the, the amount of new Bitcoins available in half. And it takes a little while for, um, you know, the continual new demand, which you can see, um, from all sorts of numbers, Bitcoin's being taken off exchanges, the numbers that are held in private wallets, the amount of buy orders on, um, um, you know, OTC markets, the amount of uh, buying interest on uh, uh, derivatives and futures exchanges. I mean, people are going long on Bitcoin. And at some point, there's not enough Bitcoin and the price just, you know, gets a, a, a squeeze in the positive direction. And that usually is when the retail crowd comes in and buys at the absolute wrong time. Um, the time the time to buy was a year ago. The second best time is probably right about now. And, and you can look at, at these institutions kind of putting their, their foot down and, and starting to allocate some of their, their balance sheet, the notable publicly traded companies, um, Square, MicroStrategy, and, and Stone Ridge. Well, and, and to, to me, one of the biggest uh, things was Fidelity saying that, you know, it's fine to put 5% of your assets in Bitcoin, I mean, you could hear my jaw hitting the floor. The the sharp ratio, you know, you're going from like 0.6 on 6040 bonds up to uh, from from a one, two, and three percent allocation. You're looking at like increase of like 350 uh, basis points in your annualized return. Um, yeah. Like, like especially right now, you know, you look at traditional portfolio allocation. We're talking about alts, uh, alternative asset investments, like a previous 60-40 allocation to stocks and bonds, because of interest rates and the Fed driving inflation, you're not going to have that allocation into bond markets anymore. It just doesn't make sense. So where does that money go? Um, you know, these guys that, you know, the, the, some of the largest asset managers in the world are, are really starting to explore this in an alternative. So, so it certainly is, uh, it's really exciting. Um, I think just to- Yeah, and, and you, were talking, you were talking earlier about, uh, um, you know, real estate and how- uh, it's 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 coming into a world of hurt, particularly on the commercial side. And uh, you know, uh, 
you know, my wife and I typically will move back and forth between crypto and real estate. When the market's really high, I'm happy to put it into real estate. When uh, the real estate market's high and crypto's low, the opposite. I mean, we're selling real estate right now. Yeah, it's, uh, listen, it's hard to get fair market value on, on large real estate right now, but, you know, you still have a decent opportunity. Well, we're not selling shopping malls, so <laughs> it's, it's, it's larger commu commercial, I mean, sorry, residential. Awesome. So, so just to touch on two things you mentioned at the beginning, um, NFTs and DeFi, I think that, you know, we, we talk about bull markets and, you know, in various time trends. Um, mm -hmm. we saw the ICO run up, we see the, you know, the parabolic up now of what's been happening in DeFi and, and the capital inflow. Um, can you take a moment to, to touch on for the attendees? Sure. Uh, what you think the current state of the DeFi is? Sure. Where is on the growth sure. curve um, and, and finally just uh, similarities between the boom in 2017 and the DeFi. Sure. So, so I, I like to um, go back to analogies to the growth of the internet. And if you're looking at the 2017 ICO frenzy, uh, I think it's, um, uh, you know, sort of a, um, a corollary of what happened uh, in the dot-com era. You had this instant realization that the internet really was going to change the world and it wasn't going to be this, look, as, as, as recently as 1994, 95, there were still people laughing at the internet. I, I, I still have a, you know, um, a Newsweek article, uh, you know, clipped out from paper, basically saying that the internet was a joke and nobody's going to want to read off of a computer screen. They, they're going to want a fine print magazine like this and that, you know, the internet will be just the ash bin of history. It's going to be just for geeks and freaks and it's not going to ever replace, you know, fine print magazines. Well, Newsweek as a print magazine has been out of business for quite a while and the internet is now arguably, you know, one of the world's largest, um, you know, uh, sectors in the trillions, right? I mean, e-commerce alone is in the trillions. Um, when Amazon first started out, it got laughed at. Uh, there were analysts who said, you know, what are we joking about e-commerce? They're never going to beat uh, a place like Walmart or Macy's. Um, the worldwide um, market for all e-commerce is less than, you know, the corner, you know, shopping mall in my, in my hometown of Pittsburgh. And um, yeah, that was true at the time. People don't look at the pace of uh, growth and at the, um, uh, the fundamental advantages of the technology once it's fully deployed. Uh, in the early days of the internet, one thing was keeping it back was you needed to install a second phone line in your home and have this you know, slow modem go eh, 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 eh. And so I remember the head of a major um, you know, uh, network, uh, television network in, in Los Angeles was just laughing at me, you know, saying, he's like, you know, our network is never going to be on the internet. I mean, my mom is not going to install the second line. She's not going to put up with the noise, et cetera. And it's just like, okay, that was 20 years ago. Here, mom, take your iPhone and watch Netflix on it, right? You know, the, the exponential increase of uh, bandwidth, the exponential um, increase of ease of use, that's all going to happen with blockchain. I mean, if, if you're looking today at, you know, how you get onboarded into blockchain uh, and the ease of use of many of these exchanges now um, and the ease of use of storing offline uh, with even just this first generation of hardware wallets versus when I got in and you only had Mt. Gox and Bitstamp uh, to, to, there was no real U.S. exchanges other than Coinbase. Um, and, and, you know, it was, it was, it was a different world and hard, hard, you know, hard, uh, you know, store, storing things offline meant, uh, writing it down on a piece of paper as a, as a paper wallet and then storing that in the safe. So we've had an exponential increase already in ease of use. I think the, uh, you know, some of the things that are going to lead to, uh, the next huge wave of hyper growth of adoption, because we still have less than 100 million people in the world who are using cryptocurrency. Uh, and that's up from under a million when I got in. So it's already been 100x in seven years. Um, and, you know, the next wave to get to a billion users, I think is going to require the adoption of, um, you know, the mobile carriers. And look, Samsung has already put uh, wallets into some of their phones. Uh, all you need now is for a Verizon, a T-Mobile. Uh, I won't say AT&T because obviously I have a little dispute there, but uh, 
uh, and they seem to be the last to move into things. But uh, you know, Verizon was was savvy enough to go and buy America Online for the you know marketing synergy, and they bought uh, Yahoo for the marketing synergy. Why don't they buy you know an exchange? They could buy an exchange or partner with one and say, hey, switch to Verizon and you'll get $200 of uh, digital assets uh, free. will come from airdrops and, uh, you know, including the hit new game, Angry Birds blockchain. That's coming. And that's a way of instantly onboarding potential, you know, 100 million uh, new users at a time every time you get, you know, uh, because what do you need to go and onboard in, in almost every jurisdiction? You need KYC. You need to know the person is who they say they are. You know, you need a photo ID. You need a proof of address. Guess what? Your telephone company already has that. Yeah, and, and I think that uh, although uh, you know, a little bit back now, but when, when Libra was looking at, uh, at launching, that was you know a big consideration. Um, you're you're onboarding a lot of users into an alternative digital currency. Um, and there was an information asymmetry. You get that scale at, uh, you know, you really get that penetration at tremendous scale. Well, yeah, and the and the uh, the competitor to the Libra uh, token, and again, Facebook, if they're allowed to launch, and you know, the U.S. government is doing everything to say no, you know, Facebook bad, you know, we don't like uh, the way you're treating advertisers, and you know, GDPR in Europe, and. Uh, you know, all the different things. I mean, if you saw the hearings, they just ask ridiculous questions. You know, how many gays and lesbians are on, are on your board of Libra? It's like, uh, I don't think I can ask the head of PayPal if they're gay or lesbian, right? Um, and, uh, you, you know, so uh, Mark Zuckerberg said something very profound. He said, look, I run a significant American-based company. You can stop me from doing Libra, but don't think that the Chinese government is going to cut and paste our business plan and, and launch the... Uh, the, the digital RMB. And of course, that's exactly what they've done. And it is now deployed. And, you know, they, they you know, are able to go. And honestly, I think it's going to not only uh, be something that, you know, gets people using WhatsApp all over the world um, and, and Alipay, et cetera, et cetera. But I think it's going to be a competitor to the IMF. I think China is going to go and say, hey, you want some aid? Great. We'll just send you digital RMB in your wallet. And, um, and the U.S. is just going to get left in the dust and, uh, and Europe as well. I mean, so it's, we're in a kind of war for the hearts and minds of the uh, digital um, uh, currency economy right now. And that's a big part of it. Yeah, the U.K. Just, I'll, I'll go back to DeFi in a second. <laughs> no problem. Yeah, the U.K. just talked about their digital currency recently, um, which is, I think, just yesterday. So it's a really interesting subject. I mean, you, you have the global consideration by a lot of these governments. Um, yeah, I would uh, just just to track timing here, since we're at the end, I think it's okay if we spill over attendees, feel free to uh, to join and participate. Um, there's not going to be uh, too, too much of a closing ceremony, but uh, we'll send kind of a follow-up to all attendees. So just want to address that now, so if we go over another 10 or so minutes and anyone drops off, um, de definitely thank you all for attending. It was, it was a fantastic conference. Um, Mike, on timing, you're good to, to keep chatting a bit? Yeah, I'm good. I'm good for another few minutes. Another few minutes? Great. All right. So, um, yeah, why don't you uh, touch on DeFi a bit? It's, it's, it's a hot topic. Sure. So I think, I think that right now, uh, you know, I mentioned that the 2017, uh, you know, was a corollary of, uh, of the dot-coms. You know, in the dot-com era, anybody with a business plan got millions from VCs hoping to flip it to Wall Street. Um, in 2017, anybody who could figure out how to make an ERC-20 token and had a business plan was able to raise, you know, first hundreds of thousands, then millions, then tens of millions of dollars because they would flip it to, uh, to Binance. <laughs> and, and, and the frenzy of, you know, I, I know I could see what was going when I saw how many digital currency funds were starting up. There was something like $8 billion that started up from like nothing um, over a period of about a year and a half. And when you saw this just wave of money that was coming in from, you know, funded by, you know, wealthy investors who didn't want to go and trade their own crypto, but they were happy to give it to, you know, the, uh, the poly chains, the multi coins, the Pantera's, uh, the Alphabets. I'm a, a limited partner of the Alphabet Fund, one of the early uh, funds that has done very well in that space. Um, you know, in other funds, you could see that um, all of these uh, funds came in with, you know, uh, you know, pocket bur pocketbooks bursting at the seams, and they had to go and buy things. And so, 
you know, the, 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 the gray ones would do wonderfully. And then it was just kind of at the end of the merry-go-round, you had like the, the wannabes, just like you did at the dot-coms. And uh, bubble popped, as they always do. And uh, there's a little bit more sobriety uh, the next time around. I know DeFi markets don't seem like sobriety, but, um, you know, they, they do have uh, much more fundamentals attached. And decentralized finance is really the way that's coming after centralized finance. Centralized finance, uh, Enzo had mentioned uh, Celsius. They actually launched a, uh, one of the early coin agendas. Um, SALT uh, lending um, launched, uh, a, a, you know, in, in early or middle of 2017. They really kind of created the CFI model. Um, Nexo is another one. And so these are regulated entities that happen to have a cryptocurrency as sort of a lo loyalty reward, um, you know, component that you can add to your returns by ending up getting different, you know, um, loyalty uh, uh, points or and or use them as part of your collateral. And so that then opened the door for uh, the wave of decentralized finance, where instead of having a government entity, um, you end up having the code, right? And it's hard for a lot of people to say, okay, the smart contract says this, uh, therefore I'm gonna trust the smart contract. Um, but, you know, it's been high risk, high reward. And, you know, if you were in early on Yearn Finance that basically said, here's our governance and uh, here's what we're gonna do with it and read the code. And um, you got in at $36, I think was their initial token sale. Um, it went up as high as $40,000 within three or four months. I mean, you just don't get thousand X returns, right? And, um, and in DeFi, some of the winners have gotten those. On the other hand, if you bought it 40,000, a month later it was down to 12. And so it's, a, it's something you have to really study a lot. And I think this is sort of the first wave of DeFi uh, I'm working with a project right now called KingSwap, which is the first regulated DeFi. So that's kind of a little bit of a hybrid. Um, and I'm, I'm talking to a couple other ones that are also components of regulation within a decentralized environment. And what that means is you're not going and going completely through the banking infrastructure, but what you're doing is you're saying there's a regulated entity that you can you know, not just say, oh, they're anonymous people read the code. So, um, you know, in, in the case of King Swap, you go to the monetary authority of the Singapore, you know, you've got, you know, uh, convertible notes and, as well as code. And uh, I think that um, as that becomes more the norm, uh, you're going to have a trillion dollars or more over the next year move into these places that right now in DeFi, and sorry, in CFI, you're able to get 12, 14% on Tether which is basically USD, try to get that from uh, any bank in the United States uh, or in Europe, much less. And um, in DeFi, when you include the returns from your tokens that are dropped for providing liquidity, I like to give it as the, you know, sort of the, uh, the, uh, the analogy of uh, when a bank gives you a toaster for opening an account, here they give you tokens that may or may not be worth anything. Um, Uniswap, you know, gave everybody who put any amount on their exchange an airdrop of tokens that quickly went to $8. Mm -hmm. They gave them 1,200 tokens. And it was worth, uh, yeah, it was worth uh, over $1,000 at one point, for sure. Yeah, and it, it basically became uh, several thousand. And, and, and you know, uh, it um, centralized, um, you know, backed by one of the top VCs and Dries and Horowitz didn't exist a few months ago. I mean, V2, V2 just came out in August and it now has more traffic than, than Coinbase. Uh, so um, we're in a fast moving space. Uh, you really have to pay attention to it. Um, I tweet about it often at Michael Turpin is my, is my Twitter handle and you can find me on LinkedIn. All my social media is just Michael Turpin, not Michael hyphen Turpin, not Michael dot Turpin. There's a bunch of fake people out there. Um, you know, pretending to be me and offering like, you know, things that, uh, you know, I'm never going to ask you to send me Bitcoin in a, in a direct message. So, um, uh, but if you're not impersonated, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, yeah, unfortunately, there's a lot of, there's a lot of impersonators out there. It's easy to do on social media, but I, I fortunately have secured my name with no dots or, you know, misspellings on, on all the major platforms. So. Um, so, so just to that effect at the end, uh, you know, when you're talking about, you, you touched on risks a bit, um, you know, what are some of the risk factors that investors should consider in the current bull market, DeFi and digital, 
um, but but mostly DeFi. Um, you know, what risk mitigating strategies should they employ? Right. Advice there. Sure. So I, I think if you're if you're there's a difference between participating in DeFi where you're a liquidity provider, in which case you want to see how safe is your principal. Um, and is the, uh, I mean, nothing's risk-free, including the FDIC, right? Um, and uh, uh, particularly in our current environment. Uh, but, you know, you want to see how safe is it and what's your, what's your risk, what's your return? And, um, you know, if you're, you know, feeling that, you know, hey, here's a, a C5 platform that's got government approval and they've got a lot of money in the bank and, you know, they're offering... 11% on Tether or they're offering this and that on, on whatever, then you may decide that's a proper risk return. Um, you may never find a DeFi that you feel comfortable with, um, or you may only go with the ones that are regulated. Um, and these models, and then you'll say, okay, I mean, look, I, when I first got into DeFi, I studied long and hard and I had somebody who was really in the know recommend that I get into, uh, you know, urine finance when it had jumped from 36 to to 6,000 and I looked and said, the risks are too bad, too big that it's gonna go back. And I missed the run up in a month from 6,000 to 40,000, right? But you really have to be paying attention to it if you're gonna play that game. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise there are liquidity providers where you just set it and forget it for a year and some of these protocols and you get paid a, a return to be a liquidity provider. So um, it's something you really have to do your own homework on. Um, or you go into a fund, right? I mean, there are funds that, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a, a partner in uh, Tradery Capital, which is an algorithmic uh, uh, trading fund. Um, they currently are just doing Bitcoin, Ethereum, and Ripple, but, you know, they're going to be offering a DeFi fund in the near future. And I think that's going to be a wave of basically DeFi funds for people who, <laughs> like in 2017, know there's a there there, but they want somebody else to assume the risks of analyzing it. Yeah, I, I listen, I, I have a lot of uh, people in my network ask me where to blindly allocate their dollars in the space. Um, so, you know, I see that, that it's, it, there is a big education hurdle and, and it does require constant monitoring and, and you know, it is, it is still early stages. So there are risks if you're not navigating the space properly. And, and what we're doing at GDA is, is that exactly, you know, we, we have a fund to fund models, we have uh, various, various different strategies, algorithmic trading, those centered on um, you know, like an index fund against the top 20. We have a DeFi fund that we're looking at launching. Uh, same with an algorithmic trading fund. Um, and we use our expertise and experience in the, in the space to provide the custody and the insurance, uh, the on-ramp, off-ramp, and, you know, facilitate the experience for, for our investor base and, and our client base. So, um, you know, we, we have those options there now. They're not uh, necessarily for retail yet available. Retail gets hit the hardest in this case. Um, you know, when, when we see any uh, breaches hacked. Well, all, all, the good all the good funds are going to be for accredited investors only at this point. I mean, retail is, is going to be a long way down the, down the road. Yeah, so, so it's, um, you know, that's, that's, it's unfortunate, but it's just a piece of, uh, of growth in any market. Um, so Michael, just, just want to close out one last question here. Um, maybe, maybe one very brief one leading into another. So, um, you know, in your perspective, number one, what's the next industry most right for digital disruption? You don't need to dive in too hard. Uh, just what, what are you tracking that you think like, like what's the next DeFi, uh, could be NFTs or something other. And, and where do you see the digital asset space in five years? And I'll leave you with that. Sure. Um, yeah, I, I think NFTs are, 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 are fast growing and big um, and they're, you know, less, uh, you know, sort of, um, they're easier to get your arms around than DeFi, right? I mean, it's basically, uh, and it's something that anybody can buy if you're talking about just digital collectibles, there's no security. Uh, it's like buying art. Right, you're buying digital art, and there's there's digital art now that's you know sold initially for ten thousand dollars and sold on the aftermarket for a hundred thousand dollars, and so you have to go and again be a student of of, of what that is, um, and uh, you know I'm involved with a couple of uh, you know, NFT uh, companies. Um, I'm an investor in one um, that is uh, um, it's called Upland, and it's um, you know, equity investment, but they, they do have um, NFTs that you can go and buy uh, representing buildings in San Francisco and New York City. And it's sort of a gamification model, but uh, they, you, you actually get NFTs. 
and um, they're, they, they've been, you know, doing okay on the aftermarket. And um, it's just at the start of this. I mean, there's, when, I, when, when, you know, when I first started, you know, researching some of these companies, they had like, you know, a couple of thousand users and then all of a sudden they're up 10 X in six months and continuing to grow. And so it's still really the very beginning of the, uh, of the NFT non fungible token marketplace. And, um, you know, there's still fungible tokens as well. Um, you know, I'm a chairman, it spun out of my incubator, first company out, it's called Aspire. Um, it's aspirecrypto.com. And, uh, you know, it is um, uh, based on the counterparty protocol that came out in the early days um, that kind of blew up because it was, it was, it was, it used Bitcoin as its fees. And when the price of Bitcoin went up, it just became untenable. And so um, Jim Blasco, who's the CTO, uh, core dev there, um, you know, basically came up with a, a, a new token. Um, so Aspire basically is the reworking of counterparty, which lets you build as many digital assets as you want really inexpensively. And then you can also make NFTs on top of those. I mean, you can literally make uh, your own, you know, Zach coin for about a dollar. <laughs> and make 90, 90, up to 90 billion of them and then do NFTs on top. Now it's a little bit of a do it yourself, but uh, you know, we think that there's a market for that. And uh, you know, just like in the early days, people said, well, who's gonna, who's gonna want a website? Why, why would anybody wanna have a website? Well, I mean, I think a few years from now, you're gonna be like, what do you mean you don't have a, what do you mean you don't have your own token? I agree. Um, I, I agree on working with some awesome partners in that space. Um, well, Michael, I, uh, I, I sincerely appreciate the time today. It was a great, uh, it was a great discussion all around. Um, for all those that attended, we will have a recording of the presentation. Um, so, so we'll follow up with, with a link and a follow message. We had over 250 um, attendees between Decentraland and this conference uniquely today. So it's really exciting for our first event. We'll definitely be hosting more. Um, I think Pretty awesome that Mike. I think our talk broke Bitcoin twelve thousand. So there we go. It was all the, it was all the people from the family offices saying uh, hitting the buy button at once during the talk. Well, we had we had some <laughs> managers managing twenty billion dollars of assets. Who knows? There we go. Hopefully, we inspired someone. Um, yeah. So so anyone that would like to get in touch, um, you know, info at GDA Capital. Um, Michael, I'll let you just. I'll I'll let you uh, give your info in a moment too. Yeah, uh, yeah. Michael Turpin, T E R P I N. So I'm at Michael Turpin on Twitter, uh, LinkedIn, Facebook, you know, WhatsApp, you name it. But uh, the ones that are easiest to get a hold of me are uh, uh, you can follow me on Twitter and then you can uh, contact me on, uh, on LinkedIn. And if you guys want more more thorough and long tail discussions, there, there is this coin agenda event on, on uh, the 28th and 29th, which you can find online. Michael, thank you again, and, and everyone hope you have a fantastic rest of your day or, or evening for those overseas.